Today we've got a problem from the 2022 Putnam exam. So at the time of recording, that's the most recent Putnam. And in fact, the results aren't even out yet. So we're gonna look at question B2, which I think is quite nice. It's like a kind of an algebraic type question that deals with the cross product. Okay, so let's look at the statement of the problem. So let's let cross, so this is the cross product, be the cross product on R3. And then our goal is to find all natural numbers in such that the following set has exactly n elements. So let's look at this set. It's gonna be the set containing all V cross W where V and W come from the set itself. So this is like a set that's not only closed undertaking the cross product, but you can also achieve every element of this set by taking the cross product of two other elements. So before we get started, let's notice that there's a very trivial case. And this trivial case is the case when n is equal to one. In other words, this set has one element. And that element is just the zero vector. So obviously zero cross zero is equal to zero. So everything works out in this case. So our goal is to find all n such that this kind of thing happens. Well, n equals one is at least one of those. Okay, so now let's explore a little bit. And so let's start with, well, the first number bigger than one, and so that would be the n equals two case. So like I said, is it possible for there to be a two element set satisfying these rules? So let's suppose that we have S with two elements and our we have an element V which is inside of S. And let's go ahead and take this element V to be not equal to the zero vector. We want it to be not equal to the zero vector and we know it's possible for it not to be equal to the zero vector because if there was only the zero vector inside of S then S would only have one element. Okay, so now let's note the following. Let's notice that V cross V is equal to the zero vector. So that's a fairly well-known property of the cross product. But anything of the form V cross V, where V comes from S, is an element from S just based on the rules that build S. Okay, well, what do we have? We've got our non-zero vector V inside of S, and then we have this zero vector inside of S. But we're also assuming that S has two elements. So notice that tells us that S has the elements zero and then this non-zero vector V. But there's a problem with that. And the problem with that is that we can never get to this element V. In other, in other words, we can't achieve this element V by our rules over here. Remember that V would need to be the cross product of two other elements from S. And I don't know how careful we need to be about like talking about this, but perhaps we could just look at maybe a multiplication chart of elements in V. So notice zero and little v are in v, and then we can take the cross product of any of these elements and notice that we only achieve the zero vector. We cannot achieve the vector v. Now let's explore the n equals three case and see what we get out of that. Okay, well, let's maybe start right here with the n equals three case. By a similar argument, we know that zero will need to be in there, and then we'll have to have two non-zero vectors. So let's say S is equal to the zero vector V and W. But notice that V cross W must be equal to one of the elements from this set. So that means it must be equal to zero V or W. 
But since V and W are both non-zero, that means that it cannot be equal to V and it cannot be equal to W. So that means it has to be equal to zero. But that's a big problem because now if we form this cross product multiplication chart with zero V and W again, we'll see that we just get all zeros here, which means just like before, there are some vectors that we cannot achieve. In this case, there are two vectors that we cannot achieve, V and W. So let's write that here. So we can't achieve V or W out of this setup. So that means that N has to be bigger than or equal to three. Let's also notice that under this setup, we see that V and W are forced to be parallel or collinear, however you wanna think about that. Recall that two vectors are parallel if and only if their cross product is equal to zero. So the cross product is like a test for parallelness, whereas the dot product is like a test for perpendicularity. Remember, two things are perpendicular if and only if the dot product is zero. Well, notice that through a similar calculation to what we've seen right here, we see that S must contain non-collinear or non-parallel vectors. So let's write that here. So S must contain non-parallel vectors. And why is that? Well, if it only contains parallel vectors, then this chart that we would make out of the cross product of anything with anything else would just give us all zeros. So that means we could not achieve any vector except for the zero vector. But that's a problem based off, again, our definition of this set over here. Okay, so I think we've like maybe done a good bit of exploration. We've seen that S has to contain some non-parallel vectors. Now let's jump into a precise solution. So via exploration, we've just shown that the size of S must be bigger than or equal to four. Also, we verbalized an argument that S must contain non-parallel vectors. So maybe I'll leave it as a bit of a homework exercise to take that verbalized argument and write it down a little bit more carefully. And now we're gonna prove the following lemma. That says that every non-zero element of S is a unit vector. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's take any non-zero, so I'll just put zero is not equal to V in S, and pick a W in S such that W and V are non-parallel. So I'll just write that as V is not parallel to W. So I think that's a standard symbol for being parallel. So if I put a cross to it, I mean they are not parallel. Okay, so let's just briefly recall what that gives us. So since they're not parallel, that means that V cross W is not equal to the zero vector. But since our set is closed undertaking cross products, we know that V cross W is a new vector inside of S. As we saw before, zero is always inside of S. Okay, so now what are we gonna do from here? Well, out of these parts, we're gonna construct possibly infinitely many vectors in S. Well, you might say, well, our S is only supposed to have finitely many elements. Well, we'll see how to take those potentially infinitely many vectors and really tame them down to finitely many vectors. Okay, so now let's set the length of V equal to some number C. So let's notice that C is strictly bigger than zero. So the length of any vector is bigger than or equal to zero, but since V is not the zero vector, its length is strictly bigger than zero. 
Okay, and then we're gonna define a recursive sequence of vectors. So let's define u0 to be equal to v cross w. And then after that, we'll define u sub m plus one equal to v cross u sub m. And this is gonna be for m bigger than or equal to zero. So let's look at a couple of examples of the vectors inside of this recursively defined sequence. So notice that u sub 1 will be equal to, let's see, v cross u sub w, but that's going to be v cross v cross w. So like that. And then u sub 2 will be equal to v cross u sub 1, but that's v cross v cross v cross w. Like that and then so on and so forth. But now we're gonna find the length of each of these vectors. So let's say this blue arrow is to find the length. So notice that the length of u1 will be equal to, well, there's a formula for it. It'll be the length of v times the length of v cross w times the sine of the angle between v and v cross w. But look, v cross w by construction is orthogonal to v, so that means the angle between them is pi over two, but the sine of pi over two is equal to one. So that means we get just get the length of v times the length of v cross w. Okay, so let's write that down. We have length v times length v cross w. But notice that the length of v is equal to c by our notation we built here, and then v cross w is simply equal to u0. Okay, but now let's calculate the length of this next one. So notice this is our u1, and for similar reasons of why u0 is perpendicular to v, u1 is also perpendicular to v. So when we take the length, we don't need that sine component. So that means we get the length of u2 is in fact equal to the length of v times the length of u1 where I'm just writing u1 as this thing right here. But above, we just calculated the length of u1 to be c times the length of u0. So that means here we have this is c squared times the length of u0. Okay, but I think we could probably see where we're going here, and via an iterative process, we'll see that the length of u sub m is equal to c to the m times the length of u sub zero. Okay, but notice that this u sub m is a potentially infinite list of vectors inside of s. But since s is supposed to have finitely many elements, we know that this potentially infinite list is really only a finite list. So that means that we have um1 equals um2 for some m1 and m2. But then applying the length to both of those, we'll see immediately that we get c to the m1 is equal to c to the m2. And I should point out here that m1 and m2 are non-equal. But since c is bigger than zero, the only number that satisfies this kind of setup for unequal exponents is the number one. So we have c is equal to one. But let's notice that's exactly what we wanted to prove. We wanted to show that every non-zero element of S is a unit vector. And what did we do? Well, we took any non-zero element of S, we set its length equal to this number C, and then we just showed that that number C, which was its length was equal to one. But having length one is exactly the same as being a unit vector. And now armed with the result of this lemma, we're ready to finish it off. So let's suppose we have non-parallel vectors. So non-parallel v and w inside of s. And I guess I should say non-parallel and non-zero. Okay, and then notice that we know that every non-zero element of s is a unit vector. So what does that mean? That means that the length of v is the same thing as the length of w, which is equal to one. 
Let's also notice that V cross W is inside of S by our construction of S. And since S only contains unit vectors, we know that the size or the length of V cross W is also one. And then if theta is the angle between V and W, notice that we have this nice formula sine of theta is the length of V cross W over the length of V times the length of W. Well, that's just one over one times one, which is one. But that means that the sine of the angle between V and W is one, but that means the angle between V and W is pi over two. So that means that V is perpendicular to W. Okay, so now let's see what all vectors in, are inside of S. Maybe we'll do that over here. Well, notice we started off with our assumption that V was inside of S and W was also inside of S. But zero is equal to V cross V by the properties of the cross product. That's inside of S. So now we've got three vectors inside of S. We also know that V cross W is inside of S. Oh, but we also know that W cross V is inside of S, but W cross V is negative V cross W, but maybe we'll leave it as W cross V. Just keep in mind that that is not the same thing as V cross W. Okay, so what do we have so far? We have one, two, three, four, five elements from S. But now I'm gonna build two more elements from S and that'll form a closed set. What we don't know yet is what happens if we take V and cross it with V cross W or if we take W and cross it with V cross W. And in order to explore that, let's recall the following fact that you would generally learn like alongside the cross product. And that is that A cross B cross C, where those are vectors, is equal to A dot C times B, so that's the scalar product of A dot C with B, and then minus A dot B with C. So that's again the scalar product of A dot B with C. So now we'd like to apply that to our setup. So let's maybe look at V cross V cross W. So that's gonna be equal to V dot W in the direction of V, and then minus V dot V in the direction of W. But we know that V and W are orthogonal to each other. We know we made that argument right here. So that means that V dot W is equal to zero, and then V dot itself is equal to one. That's because V is a unit vector. So this object simplifies to minus W. So that means over here we can add minus W to the list of things inside of S. But now using this identity again with W cross W cross V, you'll also see that minus V is inside of S. So that gives us at least seven vectors that are inside of S. So notice that from our previous facts, we saw that we must have non-parallel vectors inside of S. And the minute we have non-parallel vectors inside of S, we must have these seven vectors inside of S. But notice that they form some sort of closed algebraic set undertaking the cross product. So that tells us that N equals seven is definitely a possibility. So nothing lower than seven except for one will work. And that's because once we get these two vectors in here, we must have all seven of those vectors in there. Then what about anything more than seven? Well, like I said, once we have two vectors in here, we have all seven vectors in here like this, which means any number of vectors bigger than seven would have to be added on to a situation like this. But once we add a vector into a situation like this, it will be non-orthogonal to some of the vectors that are in there, which means when we cross product with some of the vectors in there, we'll get a non-unit vector. And that'll contradict this lemma right here. So that tells us that there's no number bigger than seven that works out here. So in the end, our possible values of n are only one and seven.
So previously I did lots of videos on the channel where we solved Putnam problems. There should be one on the screen right now if you'd like to check it out. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.